Hey, good day, it's Prezo. Thanks for stopping by. Now, this is episode four of building a diesel fueled furnace burner for your home foundry. Now, there is a playlist up above there now that will take you back to the first three episodes where I built this burner. Now, it's done now, it's finished, and it will also take you through uh, the building of the furnace that I did a couple of years ago now. But in today's episode, I want to work on this service cart. Now, that's what I'm calling it. It's just a mobile trolley that has the blower and the fuel tank. And the idea is you can take this outside when you're finished with it, you can bring it inside, store it away. It's just easy to move around, it keeps everything in one place. And what I want to do is to get all of the electrical and electronic controls and I want to package them up inside this piece of 100 millimeter square aluminium tube. Now it's the right size and I had just happened to have a piece and it's big enough to hold all of the stuff that needs to go inside there. And what I've done is I've made a 3D printed part here which will clamp onto the back of that tube and that will clamp onto that vertical pipe there and just keep it in a convenient spot. I've also got some 3D printed ends that will go on this and so we'll have a look at that today. And there's a lot of stuff that needs to go on here. We need to drill a lot of holes and mill a lot of slots and that sort of thing. And I want to make some uh, decorative fascia panels with some uh, text on them so we know what the switches are for and so on. So I'll do that. Uh, I also want to deal with this uh, flexible pipe here. This carries the air from the blower to the burner. And there's a bit of an issue with the this spring uh, gets exposed on the end of the tube. And I want to deal with that first. So let's have a look at that. This is the tube that I'll be using to connect the blower to the burner. Now this is sold uh, as dust extraction equipment and it's got a 70 millimeter inside bore there. It's nice and flexible and it's got a big bore so it carries lots of air. The only problem with it is that when you cut it, this spring uh, sort of tends to bend outwards and it gets caught on things and it's just sharp and dangerous and so on. And if you use a standard hose clamp like I've got there, it sort of fits in between the coils and, uh, and then it crosses over one of them and it just doesn't clamp down very well. So it's not a very secure fitting. Now ideally you'd get a much wider hose clamp but I haven't been able to find anything like that so what I'm going to do is use some of this uh, light gauge 25mm wide aluminium strip and I'm going to bend this into a cylinder and then I've got a hammer form here, a steel hammer form and we're going to clamp it to the hammer form and just sort of roll over one of the edges and that will keep that free end of the spring from getting loose and it'll just look neat and it'll clamp down much better. I've just wrapped a bit of masking tape around the entire tube there and I've marked the position where it overlaps. So I'll just take that off and I'll just cut my tape to that dimension. I think I'm going to leave about an extra 10 millimeters there. Now we're going to make two of these. So just uh, working with my dividers, I want to mark a line which will go on the top edge of the hammer form. We'll do that before we roll it up in the jeweler's rolls. Now that should be enough, that'll sort of clamp down on the hammer form. So you can see that that strip is too long. Uh, I'll cut this off about another six millimeters short. I may still have to trim it later, but I don't want it to overlap when we do the hammer forming. Okay, that's about right there. So we'll put a hose clamp on that now. And what we need to do is tap this down so that the scribe mark that I put on this previously is level with the top of the hammer form. Just so we get a consistent bend on it. Okay, that looks pretty good. Uh, what we're gonna do now is start tapping this over with a plastic mallet. 
And the trick here is just don't be too greedy. Just go around slowly. You're tapping down that edge at about 45 degrees. And you want to get the material moving over consistently all the way around. This uh, high density polyethylene mallet has seen better days. You wouldn't believe it, but this stuff just sort of perishes and rots and it forms a sort of a skin on it that flakes off. Uh, when it's brand new, they're great. Uh, I probably could trim the end off that exposed new plastic, but that's all the mess that you're seeing there. And it's starting to roll over nicely. When you're doing this, uh, one of the tricks you can use, instead of just hitting directly down onto the stock, is to draw the mallet across in the direction you want the metal to flow. So in this case here, working on this edge, I want to bring the mallet across as I hit it, and that will roll the metal over better, rather than pushing it down and reducing the amount of overlap that I've got here. So it's sort of like a, a glancing blow. Now I've got nearly all of that rolled over. I'm just going to lower this down in the vise. I'm just going to go all the way around and tap it down fairly hard. Well there it is there now and uh, what we'll do is make another one and then we'll put this onto the tubing, put a hose clamp on and just uh, check to see if we need to trim anything off this end here to make it close up tight. Well, there's the first one that I made and we can poke that on there now and get a hose clamp on I hope. Okay, so that's it there and if you look inside where the free end of that spring is, it's sort of caught behind that lip and it won't poke out later on and be a nuisance. This is a 3D printed part that I made and it forms the connection between the outlet from the blower and my flexible tube. And I've wrapped about four or five layers of electrical insulation tape around that and that gives me a nice resilient surface to clamp down onto. And our tube now goes over that and I can clamp down and now I've got a good solid connection there. I did have to trim this just a fraction, probably about six millimeters uh, to get it to fit over there and not overlap when I tighten up the clamp. The other thing I've done here is I've fitted one of these straps to keep the fuel tank secure and stop sliding around or falling off and it's just one of those pull straps. It means you can take the tank off to clean it or fill it, but it does make it more secure. So this is what I'm going to use for my housing for all of the electrical and electronic stuff. It's a piece of 100mm square aluminium tubing, got a 3mm thick wall on it, and I rescued this from the skip, so it was pretty scratched and beaten up and I got it. And what I've done is I've sanded that all over with a random orbit sander just to get rid of the worst of the damage. This will get powder coated with a textured powder coat, so you won't notice any of that. And on the ends here, I've squared the ends by putting them in the milling vise and I've run a cutter along the first edge. And then you rotate it through 90 degrees in the vise and set it up against a milled stop. The second cut you need to eyeball, but once you've got that one dialed in, you just keep rotating it and cutting each edge as you go and then flip it and do the same at the other end. So now I've got nice square ends, they're all in one plane. And to cover those ends, I've got these 3D printed caps with threaded inserts. Now they'll fit inside there, that'll cover everything over so you don't see any of the guts of it. And on the back, I've got another 3D printed part, and this is going to get screwed onto that surface there. And that will allow me to mount this onto the handle of the surface cart. So the next step is to work out where everything goes inside this. So I've got lots of switches, there's power supplies, there's um, inlets and outlets and so on. And what I'm going to do is just sort of eyeball it all. I'll put Sharpie marks where I think everything needs to go. You do need to think about the layout of the switches to make it logical how it all works. 
So what we have to fit inside here is the AC to DC 12 volt power supply. This is for the fuel pump and this is the pulse width modulation control for the fuel pump as well. So there's sort of two uh, items there need to go at one end. Then to control the blower, I, I think I showed this in a previous video and I'm going to dismantle all of this and actually fit it inside the box so it looks neat and tidy. But I won't be using that AC out, I'm going to use this one instead. So this will go on the front of the box about there somewhere. And then uh, what else we got? Um, yeah, we got a couple of uh, rocket switches here. These got built-in neons so that when everything's live we can tell, we can just look at the lights there. And uh, what else? Oh, underneath there will be a gland in here for the AC in and there will be an outlet, this one here, this is like a, a two-prong plug. This will take the power to the fuel pump so I can disconnect the fuel pump if I need to. So I hope I got all that right. Uh, let's go and drill some holes now and then we'll come back and we'll start packaging this up. So there's that box now finished and what you would have seen me do is uh, drill all of the round holes, all of the rectangular pockets were done on a little CNC mill and you would have seen me jam this piece of particle board in both ends of that tube there and that was just to make the tube more rigid and stop it from chattering while I cut those rectangular pockets. So these two on top here they will be for the rocker switches and they just clip in like that. And later on there will be a laser cut and laser etched panel to go on the surface here and this will have the labels for all of the switches and the potentiometers so we know what does what. I've also fitted the 3D printed clamp on the back and I've fitted one of the ends at this point. And what I've been doing is just ensuring that all the holes are in the right place. So the next step is to go ahead and package up all of this uh, wiring and electronics, get it all inside there. This for me is the least favourite part of the project. I hate doing this. Uh, I always end up sort of with messy wiring. I, I really admire those people who have got those beautiful skills at being able to cable things up and make them look tidy and neat. But in my view, if you can just jam it inside and put an end on it, uh, who cares? <laughs> so I've got everything running on the bench. I was able to dismantle the blower speed control and rewire that so it can be fitted to this box here. That's all working. So what I'll do is I'll get all that packaged up and then I'll bring it back and then we'll run the blower and the fuel pump from this box. So let's come back shortly.
Well, there it is, fully assembled now, and I'm going to tell you now, it was a pain in the bum to do that. Uh, it was really difficult to feed all the wires through and get everything in place. I made a mistake in using secondhand wire. Uh, it's a lot heavier gauge than it needs to be, and it makes it harder to feed everything through. So when I break this down and do the powder coating on it, I'll completely rewire it. I'll go and buy some new wire, get something that's uh, an appropriate gauge, and I'll assemble one module at a time rather than try and do it all on the bench and then stuff it inside that box there. That was a mistake. And the other mistakes are the LED displays upside down, the neons and the switches are on permanently, so I need to look at that. But everything works, so let's come a bit close and have a look. Okay, let's have a look at the blower first. So I've got that turned down to zero, and it reads zero on the digital display there. And we can ramp that up to about half speed. 120 volts should be about half and then we run it up to full speed so that's all good now with the fuel pump you won't be able to hear it but I can feel it running so we'll turn that down to zero doesn't run at all and just kicks in there now and I can feel that running up to full speed as I adjust that control there now, in a previous video, somebody suggested I fit an inline filter to the fuel delivery. I've done that. It's a RICO filter. Now, there is a filter on the pump that will be in the tank. We've got one in line, and there is a filter on the back of the fuel burner nozzle. So I think we're pretty good for filtration. So what we need to do now is actually put the fuel pump in the tank. I'll fill the tank, and then we're going to run it for 15 minutes and collect the fuel. And then we can work out if we're getting close to two and a half gallons an hour that the burner nozzle should be delivering. So let's try that. Well here's the setup I got for testing. So I filled the tank with about 5 litres of diesel. The pump's in the tank. Now it turns out that 2.5 gallons, that's US gallons, not the gallons everybody else used to use, but the US gallons, that comes out to 9.464 litres. If we divide that by 4 it's 2.366. Now that's a 4 litre container. So I'm going to run the pump into that for 15 minutes. We'll collect the fuel and measure it multiply by four that should give us a benchmark just to see what that nozzle and the pump combination can deliver so let's do that now okay I've just stabilized that container with a couple of bricks there and I've got the stopwatch set up here so I've got the fuel valve fully on and I'm going to run the pump at full speed so uh, let's let's see what happens all right um, here we go Okay, well, we're collecting fuel, so I'm just going to stand by and monitor this, so I won't make you wait. Uh, we'll come back when we're at 15 minutes, and we'll see how much we got. Okay, we're coming up on our 15 minutes, so I'm just going to shut this down at the pump. Now, now there is some residual fuel still coming through. So I'm just going to turn off the, the valve here. Alrighty, so we're going to measure that now, and we're looking for 2.366 litres. Anyway, let me check it, and then we'll see what sort of efficiency we're getting from the nozzle and the pump. Well, there's the total fuel collected. Yeah, we're probably not more than two litres there, but let's check it. Well, that's one litre, so I'll pour this back in the 10 litre tank. And I'd say this will probably be another litre. Well, 
Well, there you go, exactly two litres. All right, two litres, uh, let me do the maths and we'll come back and we'll see what we got. Okay, just crunch those numbers. What we're getting is eight litres per hour. That's a total of 2.113 US gallons per hour. And we were shooting for 2.5 gallons per hour, so we fell short, but we're getting an efficiency of 84%. So I think that uh, as long as we're atomizing fuel and as long as we've got enough fuel going into the furnace, then it's a bit irrelevant really what the gallons per hour will be. Now somebody mentioned that maybe the pump's not supplying sufficient pressure, but Perry Merritt got in touch with me and he said it's not the pressure, it's whether you can actually put more fuel per hour into the furnace. Now the pump and nozzle I've got are capable of atomizing the fuel so it burns, so it's not the pressure. We could upgrade to a bigger nozzle or we could upgrade to a high capacity pump but let's try it out the furnace and see whether it will work efficiently uh, with the blower running and the lid closed and then we'll try and melt some aluminium so uh, yeah I, i'm sort of happy with that 84 percent is not bad it's a couple of days later and i'm ready to test the furnace for real so we're going to actually light the burner in the furnace i'll put the crucible in there with some material in it and we'll see how long it takes to melt from coal to molten. Now, um, in the meantime, I made a couple of improvements on the furnace itself. The first one is I've painted the lid. Now, that's painted with that same high temperature paint that I use on the body of the burner, but I couldn't cure this in an oven, so it's basically just cosmetic, but it looks nice, so uh, it, and it might protect it for a bit longer. Now, the other thing I've done is I've fitted this little stop here. Now this came from my Kiwi mate, uh, John Pierce. He's got a channel called the Hobby Machinist NZ. He built a similar style of furnace. He sent me this tip and he said, just weld a little tab on there. So when you go to shut the lid, you don't have to worry about wrestling it into the right place. So you just basically swing it to that stop, lower it down and it's done. So that's a huge improvement and it just makes it a bit easier to use, uh, especially when you've got fire and smoke and everything happening. You don't want to be mucking around with that. Now when I did a test run on this a couple of days ago, uh, I wanted to be able to dial in the settings on the blower and the fuel pump and I found that lighting the burner was a bit of a problem when it's inside the furnace. Now up until now I've just lit it up, um, you know, sort of on the bench or outside the furnace and uh, what tends to happen is that uh, you've got to reach down inside there. Now you could use a piece of burning cloth or a piece of burning paper and I tried both those methods and not really suitable. Burning paper tends to just blow out very quickly, uh, like the actual blower uh, lifts it out of the furnace before it's really lit the fuel. A uh, piece of burning cloth, uh, well, you've got to keep finding bits of cloth and you've got to have stuff to soak it in. And Again, it stays inside and it tends to burn up and makes a mess. Now, I tried using a sort of a propane torch. You can get it down in there and it's sort of your hands are a bit clear of the top of the furnace, but the flame snuffs out very quickly. So uh, that was awkward and annoying, especially when the fuel spraying in there and it doesn't want to light. So at the end of the day, I thought what I really need is some way of lighting it so your hand is a long way from the nozzle and also something that's got a good, reliable flame. And here it is. So basically, it's a giant matchstick. So let's have a close look at what that's all about. Now, this is nothing more than a big, long piece of steel rod with a hook in the end there. There's a threaded section on this end here and there's a big washer and a hex nut both sides of this material here. Now that material is this stuff, it's just hessian webbing. This is used in the upholstery trade and it's got a hole punched in the centre there big enough to go over that steel rod. So I cut up about 30 of those squares and I squished them in between the two large washers and then I trimmed off as much as I could with a pair of scissors. The rest of this was actually done in the metal lathe. So I spun that and uh, with a sharp tool, it takes a while, it sort of fluffs up on the outside there, but as it gets closer and closer to the diameter of the steel washers, it starts to behave more like a solid material and you can trim it off and make it a true cylinder. And this works out about 45 millimeters diameter. Now you soak it in kerosene, it lights readily, uh, but it doesn't burn the hessian, it's just the kerosene fuel that's burning. Now eventually this will get smaller and smaller, obviously, but it's uh, able to be repaired. So you just take the nuts off, fit some more of these. I've got tons of it. <laughs> there it is there. So um, that's my fire lighter. 
So uh, let's see how it behaves and uh, how you put it out. That's the more important thing. As you can see, that lights very readily. It's a big bushy flame. It's easy to maneuver it inside the furnace, but I found that putting it out is a bit of a problem. So that's what this little snuffer is for. So it just goes in there and it goes out almost straight away. And that means that once the burner is lit, you haven't got to mess around trying to put that out. You don't want to dunk it in water. So I think that's going to be a, a more reliable way of lighting up the burner, which is what we're going to do now. So the uh, procedure for getting the furnace underway would be to wheel a service cart close to the furnace and then take the entire burner assembly and push that into the body of the furnace and then lock that in place. So the fuel valve is off for the moment. We're going to get the fuel pump running and the blower on low and then we'll light it. This is the material that will be melting for this test here. This is just an old car cylinder head that's been cut up. I wouldn't use this for making good quality castings. This is really for throwaway things or one-off castings that don't require a lot of machining. Now, there's bits of steel uh, in this scrap. It's full of charcoal and rubbish, so uh, it's going to be a lot of dross, but it'll do for a demonstration. So there's two pieces in there. We'll get the first one melted and then we'll drop this one in later. Okay, let's uh, test this in. I've got some marks on my console here for both the fuel pump and the blower. Now I set these during a test the other day and I know where the blower needs to be when the furnace is heating up and then when we get the furnace hot we can turn the blower up a notch. Now with the fuel pump uh, it's running at about 80% and that should be enough to get it lit. So alright let's see what happens. I'm going to turn the blower on very low. So that's really just ticking over. Okay, let's light our big match. Alright, so fuel on.
time after I skimmed the dross. I just turned the blower off, turned the fuel off, and that flame keeps burning for about 10 minutes. Now, Perry Merritt, who built the original of this, and I talked about this, and both of us are completely mystified as to how there can still be fuel burning at this point. Now, I do know that even with the fuel pump off, there's a bit of pressure in the line, so some fuel continues to dribble through there. I'm gonna turn the blower back on. stops all that black soot. But that little flame that's there now will continue to burn for quite a while. We're now at about 23 minutes after I lit the burner and you can see there's still smoke rising from that furnace but I'll just leave this outside until that's cooled down a bit. Now the actual melt time from when I put the first piece of material in was about 10 minutes. Now just going back over the uh, you know the previous experience I've had with the propane burner that's roughly three times faster than propane. So I sort of feel confident now that we can melt brass in about uh, 20 minutes maybe. Uh, it used to take me an hour with my old propane burner to fully melt brass to casting temperature. And uh, you know maybe we can be looking at copper and bronze as well. I think that's capable of melting cast iron, but the refractory inside there is not rated for those temperatures. So I'm sort of stuck with those uh, you know, uh, non-ferrous alloys. But I'm totally happy with that. If I can melt aluminium in 10 to 15 minutes, uh, that's a big saving in time. And given that uh, on our previous fuel test, that means we've used about two litres of fuel. So that's uh, about $5 in today's money here in Australia. I mean, that's cheaper than bottled water. <laughs> so um, I think that's, that's a bonus as well. You know, I've got a 20 litre fuel tank uh, with diesel in it. That holds 10 so I can get plenty of casting done with that amount of fuel. So uh, let's, uh, let's finish up here now. We'll go inside, we're gonna talk about what's happening in the next video and we'll just wrap up what's happened here today. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Well, this is the debrief. Now, I'm totally happy with yesterday's test run. Uh, it sort of ticked all the boxes and addressed all the criteria that I set out in the original video on this series. And uh, I feel confident now I can move forward and actually finish off this service card completely. So there are a couple of minor issues that still need to be addressed. So let's have a close look at those. One of the things that does need to be addressed that's fairly important is how to mount this fuel pump rigidly in the tank. Now at the moment it's just sort of flopping around in the bottom. And also this large open neck here will allow dust and debris and chips and insects to get into the fuel. So I want to be able to close off the top of the container with the original cap. So in the next video I'm going to make a sort of a rigid conduit that bolts to this area on the top of the tank and it will have a hole large enough to fit the pump down inside and also the conduit will carry the fuel uh, line and the wiring but it will sort of uh, close off most of the top of the tank. There will be a very small gap there which we might be able to pack with something. But I think that's going to be a better way of mounting the pump and it will ensure that it's always sitting in the bottom of the tank and covered with fuel. In the next video I want to go ahead and finish off this control box here so that will mean powder coating this aluminium tube. I want to make a laser cut and laser edge panel for the top of the box. Now it will have labels for the two switches and it will also have graduated marks for the running positions of the fuel pump and the blower when the furnace is running hot and when it's starting. So that will just give us a ballpark position for each of those controls. I don't like these two knobs. Um, I'm going to get two the same. Uh, this potentiometer here has got a very short stem, so I'll probably need to replace that one. And the other thing I'll do is completely rewire the inside of the box. So I've got this 18 gauge wire. It's thin and flexible, but will carry the current. So I think that'll do a neater job for the inside of the box. 
Now with all of that done, this is then a finished project and we can actually go ahead and use it to make some castings. So what castings am I talking about? Well, let's have a quick look at that and then we'll wind up. Well, I do have a project in mind that does require some castings and I've got the patterns here on the bench at the moment. So have a close look at those, see if you can figure out what they're for. Okay, I'll give you a sneak preview, all right? So that's it, that's a future project, but I've got one more video to go on the furnace burner build and then we'll put that to good use to make these castings. And I invite you to join me for that project, it'll be fun and interesting. And I've got some announcements to make about the channel as well. And the changes to the channel have come out of some comments that were made on a previous video. So I think you might find that interesting and uh, it's going to be of some benefit to other people. But we'll talk about that later. But for now, I'm going to say cheerio and uh, join me for the next video. And uh, as always, presso, I'll see you next time. Cheers.